Uh, over the past several weeks, we have been in a trial. We have seen a trial over the past several weeks where we have put witnesses on this stand to try to get the verdict of verdict that Jesus deserved to die. As the jury, you heard from many witnesses, but there was a call from the court to call one more witness. I don't know why she wants to come back, but we will hear from her in just a moment. Over the past several weeks, I, the prosecuting attorney, along with my colleagues who have been my assistant, have brought witnesses up to the stand, such as Matthew. Matthew, the tax collector, who Jesus befriended and called him one of his best friends, a sinner to the core. He showed us that Jesus did not sit with the proper, but ate with sinners, the lowly of lows. And then the following week, we brought a woman up who admitted that she committed adultery and she deserved to be stoned. But Jesus said that she should not be punished, but rather be forgiven. Throughout the rest of the time, we heard from the Apostle John, one of his closest friends, who tried to bring up this crazy idea that Jesus is the bread of life, and that when we feed on his flesh and drink from his blood, that we somehow get some blessing from a courtroom. That seems absurd. We heard from other witnesses, Mary of Magdala came up because she <coughs> sat at the foot of the cross the day that uh, Jesus was put onto the cross. And she shared that she saw him breathe his last. And she wants to come back up. I don't know why we have already decided this case the case of Jesus and whether or not he deserved to die for all the things he did wrong throughout his life, we had already decided. He was guilty and deserved to go to the cross. So I'm sorry that I'm bringing the jury back to the courtroom for one more time. I don't know what she wants to share. I know it's not going to be much of benefit to you, but we're going to humor her and let her share whatever she might need to share. And so, as a lead prosecutor, I will personally cross this witness to make sure she doesn't share anything that might sway you in the wrong way. We call to the stand Mary of Magdala. Now Mary, as you sit on the stand, let me remind you that you still are under oath. Yes, that's all I want. I want an opportunity to tell the truth about Jesus and how his transformation is our transformation. All right, so we will start from the top. We'll recap for the jury so they're on the same page with us. Last time you were here, you shared with us that Jesus certainly did breathe his last breath. You certainly don't plan to retract that statement and say something crazy like he just fainted or maybe he resuscitated or something crazy like that, are you? Oh no, Jesus definitely died. I saw the soldiers pierce his side with a spear. I saw the blood and water run out of him. That's a sign, though, that the body's fluids had gravitated to the lower part of his body because the heart was no longer pumping. After that, I followed Nicodemus and Joseph to, of Arimathea to the tomb cut in the rock. I watched them prepare the body with love. I watched them place it on a shelf in the cave tomb and roll the great stone across the opening. Yes, Jesus was definitely dead and buried. See, I don't understand why you called all these people from their homes on the one day that they're able to take it easy and rest, maybe even sleep in a little bit. The jury's now brought here to listen to you tell us what you already told us, which is that Jesus is dead, and that's the end of it. 
Jury, we are sorry for bringing you all the way here today to hear the same thing again. Jesus is not dead. That's what I tried to tell you when I was here last time. After the burial, I went home to observe the Sabbath. It was really hard to thank God for his goodness, and I kept thinking of Jesus through the prayers. I went to bed, but I couldn't sleep. When it was almost morning, I got up and made my way back to the dark, and through the dark to the tomb. I thought just being close to Jesus, even in death, might ease the pain of my grief just a little. I understand. I, I can feel where you're at. I am sure that the night that you had had to have been terrible. Seeing your master die on the cross. I get the emotions. I see what's going on. Uh, but you're getting away from the fact that he was dead. And so we... We're not going to hear some story, are we, about how the stone was rolled away and that the body was stolen, that, that uh, I, I heard that rumor that was out there and we're about to, to go after those guys for potentially stealing the body. Uh, now I hope you're, go, you're not going to try to convince us, uh, this court, that the body proves, that body is gone, proves that Jesus somehow rose from the dead, that... Uh, that he that he's alive again. I heard that rumor, and I just can't believe it. It's no rumors. I saw Jesus. He spoke my name, and I recognized him. I touched him. I even tried to cling to him, but he wouldn't let me. He explained that he must return to the Father so that his spirit would be with the Holy. I'm not sure exactly what he meant about the spirit. Mary, Mary, try to think rationally. You were stressed. You were exhausted. You were overcome with grief. It makes sense that someone, perhaps the gardener, spoke to you, tried to comfort you in your overwrought state, wanting so much for these events from the previous day to be undone or untrue. You imagined that the person you saw was Jesus. Now that makes more sense, doesn't it? I can only tell you what I saw and what I experienced. I did think it was the gardener at first, but when he spoke my name, I knew it was Jesus. And when I looked at him directly, I saw that he wasn't as he had once been, all bruised and bloody. He was different than I'd ever seen him. He appeared like the description Peter, James, and John gave of him when he was transfigured on the mountain. It, he was transformed in a way I just can't describe. You have to have been there to have seen it, to experience the risen Lord for yourself, to be able to understand. I must say, as I'm listening to your testimony, I feel your passion. I feel your faith. I, I see the zeal that you have, that you, you, you believe this. And, and for that, uh, it's interesting. But we still go back to the fact that there weren't any corroborating witnesses. Uh, a people, a jury, cannot change a verdict based on one woman's testimony. There was no one else that can, uh, that can understand this, that saw it. And so uh, I don't know what help you can give. But that's a fantastic thing. There are corroborating witnesses. First, there were the disciples who spoke with Jesus after I did, and then there was Thomas who actually put his hand in the wound of Jesus' side. And what about the two disciples who met Jesus on the road to Emmaus, but didn't recognize him until he broke bread in their homes? And don't forget the thousands, no, millions of people who have been transformed and whose lives have been changed by believing through the, the forgiveness of sins brought about by Jesus' death and resurrection. They are now children of God. All these people can testify that my story is true. I'm listening. And the more you share, the more I might say it's true. The more you share, the more witnesses we see. Is there a way this could be true? Are, are there any more facts you could give us? Yes, absolutely. Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God. He gave up his power and glory to die for us. 
by believing that through him we are forgiven for our sins. We have hope of eternal life with God. He has made us brothers and sisters, and through him we can now call God our Father too. We continue to meet Jesus and be nourished in faith through the working of the Holy Spirit in word and sacrament. And this transforms us. It gives us hope for the future, for life after death. But more than that, it transforms us now in this life. Having a continuing relationship with God makes even the pains of this life endurable. It makes how we relate to each other and to all people different. For we see each other with the loving eyes of Christ. And it unites us with people at every time and in every place. In fact, it especially unites us on this day as believers in Jesus all over the world who celebrate his resurrection with that ancient greeting. Hallelujah! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed! Hallelujah! Mary, you have given some very interesting thoughts. I appreciate more than I did when this first began for you coming to the stand. I have no further questions. You are dismissed. Thank you for listening. I've never done this before, court to the jury who's here today. I'm a prosecutor. I am here to share the facts of a case. And I have never once shared uh, an opinion that I had, but I've been listening over the past several weeks. I've been listening to the different witnesses come and share their stories, as you have listened as well. And as more and more that I listen, I thought I was going to hear a bunch of emotionally charged, foolish claims that were, that were contradictory to one another and that would be far off from the truth. We brought super fans to the stand. And whenever you have a super fan, it, you treat the person you're talking about differently. If you're a Cubs fan or a Mets fan, you think your, your team is the best no matter what's going on. If you're a fan of an artist or a Hollywood character, they always do the things right. And so when witnesses come forward, I expect them to kind of spread the truth. But it was interesting, as I listened to these witnesses, they didn't put themselves on a high pedestal. Remember Thursday? when Simon Peter was up on the stand and he said that oftentimes he spoke before he gave thought to what he was going to say? He admitted that on the stand. <laughs> the adulterous woman came and said that she did deserve a punishment, that she did deserve to be punished for what she had done. Throughout the time, these people came forward and made claims that said they were not perfect. They were far from holy, but they all pointed to their need for a savior, for someone to come and to give them relief from their, their hope, from, from what, was, what they dreaded, what they, what they held so firm. I suppose all of you here in the jury also may feel that way sometimes. That you feel that you are in desperate need of a Savior. That your sins, which are great, need to be washed away to be whole once again. And I'm sharing with you that this court was destined to answer the question whether Jesus deserved to be put on that cross. When we started, I was trying to make the claim that he deserved to be on that cross because of all the things that he did wrong throughout his, his time on earth. I still believe he deserved to be on that cross. In fact, if you talk to Jesus, he said that he deserved to be on that cross. But not for what he did, but for what he came to do. Because he needed to be on that cross to bring to you the forgiveness of sins, which could only be won by a Savior, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. The verdict was right. He deserved to be on that cross. 
the reasoning was wrong. It wasn't for him, for he was perfect and holy and blameless. But it was for you. And it was for me. So that we might have the confidence that the resurrected Christ, the Son of God, has given us a chance to live forever in heaven. That's the good news. That's what is Easter is all about. To hear that Christ is risen and that we are declared not guilty because Christ took on that guilt for us. That we will no longer have to fear death because Jesus took the sentence for us. The case is dismissed. The victory is won. And alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And now let that peace, which comes from Jesus Christ, keep your hearts and minds firmly fixed on the Savior, because that is a fact. Amen. Amen. At this time, we collect.